Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. I am Kaylee Lines here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, where we brought you the news earlier this week from the Harris campaign about a milestone crossed half a billion dollars fundraised since Joe Biden left the race five weeks ago, 540 million to be exact, of, of which 82 million, the campaign says, was raised at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago last week. Now, I will note here for full disclosure, Michael R. Bloomberg, Michael R. Bloomberg the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, has contributed $19 million to Future Forward, which is a flagship super PAC supporting Harris. I say that as we aim here to provide you with all of the facts. And the facts are right now there is a fundraising gap between Trump and the RNC and Harris and the DNC. Filings show that the Biden to Harris campaign has raised more than a billion dollars this cycle, while Trump and the RNC has raised a little north of $635 million. And it is to the RNC and its co-chair we go now. Laura Trump, I'm pleased to say, is joining me here on Bloomberg TV and radio. She, of course, is the co-chair of the Republican National Committee. Great to have you, Laura. Welcome back to Bloomberg. As we consider this fundraising gap, how do you aim to close it? Who do you go to? Yeah, well, listen, I don't think we ever keep pace with Democrats traditionally as Republicans. Look, you look back at the 2016 race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and and she far outraised us. And we know the outcome of that election. Now, of course, money is important. It uh, affords us the ability to buy TV ads, to do digital advertising, to have a great ground game. And we're really proud of the the number that we've raised so far. I think our most proud number may be our small dollar uh, digital online fundraising. We are approaching our 50th day of over a million dollars raised in small dollar donations. These are donations under like $40 on average. And I think what that says is that you have the support Mm -hmm. of the American people behind Donald Trump right now. So we always aim to raise more money. We always try to encourage people to donate. And even in this bad economy that really is hurting so many people, we are still seeing very big fundraising numbers for Donald Trump. Well, as you talk about the small dollar donors specifically, is that where you think more of the money you can raise will come from, from the grassroots? Or are there other big ticket donors that you think you can pull in who may not have yet contributed? to the campaign. Oh, we do we do have our, our eye on some donors who we're bringing back into like the fold or maybe some some new donors. I won't I won't give any names today, but uh some some new donors as well. Look, you've seen Donald Trump really resonate with Silicon Valley over the past 6 months or so, and I think he's really shaken a lot of people awake and a lot of people are now realizing how much better off their life, their businesses and the trajectory of this country were when he was in office. And so you're seeing a lot of new donors and first time donors as well come in in a very big way. I do a lot of fundraising calls. I I go to a lot of fundraising events. And oftentimes there are people coming up to me saying, I have never been to any political fundraiser in my life. I'm here maxing out to the RNC and the Trump campaign because they want Donald Trump back in office. Well, ma'am, of course, it's one thing to raise money. It's another to consider how to spend it and what the strategy should be and how it should change now that it's Kamala Harris at the top of the Democratic ticket instead of Joe Biden. Polling polling is consistently showing us that it does seem the map may be wider for her than it was for Biden in terms of states she could win. She, of course, is spending time in Georgia today. There's indications she's polling better in North Carolina. Do you have to rethink your allocation to some of those states like in the Sun Belt now that It is the Harris campaign, not the Biden one. Yeah, well, listen, of course, you have a different candidate. You do have to change your tactic uh, to an extent. And we certainly are doing certain things in in very specific states. And we're looking at all the same polling as well. And we're making sure that where we need to kind of firm things up, we're going to allocate a little bit more money there. We're going to put more boots on the ground in those areas. So, yeah, it's, it's a different game. But look, I think that Uh, Apparently, we're going to hear from Kamala Harris herself in her first television interview alongside her running mate uh, tomorrow night. We'll see how that goes. And I think that after the September 10th debate, I think you're going to see another shift in numbers. I think people are going to very clearly see who Kamala Harris is. She's got a lot of questions to answer. She seems to have avoided the media very well to this point. And we really don't know where she stands on a lot of issues. And so I believe once the American people are not only reminded that she's been in office for three and a half years, that life is harder because she has been vice president 
as well for three and a half years. And she's got to sell the American people on four more years of this. I believe we're going to see polling mm -hmm. shift again. And uh, we feel very confident all across the country that we have our eye on exactly what we need to focus on and that indeed Donald Trump will be reelected on November 5th. Well, well, I guess we'll wait and see what further detail we get from Kamala Harris in that interview tomorrow. But if I could just get some more detail from you, Laura, you were talking about identifying potentially areas in which you will now need to shift strategy and invest more resources. Could you illustrate for us where some of those areas are? Is it North Carolina? Is it is it Georgia? Where exactly are you now targeting to a greater degree? Yeah, well, listen, North Carolina is definitely a state where we've seen some movement. It, it looked very positive for Donald Trump in uh, whenever he was uh, going against Joe Biden. It still shows Donald Trump up on Kamala Harris, but we want to make sure that we increase that lead. So we certainly are prepared to put more uh, more money into that state. It is my home state, and it's one that I, of course, want to win. <laughs> and I think Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a must-win state. I think that you know every election cycle we have seen consistently how important that state has become. I think the margins have tightened yeah. quite a bit there. Uh, you're going to see Donald Trump in Wisconsin uh, coming up today, and so you know we're we're making sure that everywhere that we felt very good prior to Kamala Harris being the the nominee for the Democrats, we want to feel just as good on the other side of things. So we're, we're prepared to invest wherever we need. Well, as you look at your home state, are you worried that the gubernatorial candidate there, Mark Robinson, could actually create a drag on Donald Trump's own chances? Is he a problematic candidate for the Republican Party? No, listen, I don't think uh, you've ever seen that sort of movement for Donald Trump. In fact, I would say it's the opposite. I think that Donald Trump typically helps out the the candidates in, in these various races, down ballot races, whether it's within the state or for uh, the House or the Senate. And so that that's not a concern at all. And I actually think you're going to look to races like, you know, the, the race in Montana, the Senate race there. You're going to look at Ohio and Pennsylvania. And I think you're going to see that Donald Trump is going to be a huge boost for a lot of the down ballot candidates and the races within those various states. So that's not a concern for us at all. Well, of course, you know Donald Trump more better than most people ever will. You are not just the co-chair of the RNC. You are also his daughter-in-law. And what we have heard from Donald Trump pretty consistently in recent weeks on the campaign trail is that he is hearing from people close to him, his advisors, that they want him to focus on policy, less so on personal attacks. But it does seem, and he has said as much, that he'd like to keep going with the personal attacks. Do you have his ear on that, Lara, as his daughter-in-law and as RNC co-chair? Do you think he should be focusing more on policy? Well, I certainly have his ear and he certainly asked my opinion about a, a variety of different things. And listen, I think that people have been very quick to criticize Donald Trump for the way he operates. And he definitely does not operate, Kaylee, like a, a typical politician. He's still, even though he's he was president for four years, doesn't like to consider himself a politician. And I actually think you look back at, at the 2016 election, for example, Donald Trump was such a great brander of people that it really gave him an edge during the primary with 16 other candidates, all of whom could have been great presidents or great presidential nominees for the Republican ticket. And you look at the way that he branded Hillary Clinton. You look at the way that even in the early primaries in 2024, you saw him do the same thing with people like Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. It's Donald Trump who was left standing at the end. So sometimes people don't agree with the way he operates in the beginning, but I actually mm -hmm. think that people down the line start to realize maybe he had the right idea to begin with. Well, something else that many may disagree with Donald Trump about is is whether or not he should be willing to say now, I will accept the results of the election, whatever they are. Instead, what we have heard from him is suggestions that as long as he thinks it was free and fair, that's when he will decide. Some have read that as if he wins, he'll accept those results, especially considering that at the RNC, Laura, you are not just charged with getting a Republican elected uh, to the presidency. It's about the Republican Party as a whole and the balance of power in Washington. Are you concerned that that kind of rhetoric around election integrity may actually harm the Senate and congressional candidates who are trying to keep hold of the House and turn the Senate blue? What if they're able to do that and, and, and your father-in-law does not win? Is he still going to claim that this election was not valid? Uh, look, I think that what you've heard from Donald Trump is if this is a fair election, which is something that I'm working on day and night at the RNC, it's the number one focus of the RNC right now. We have a huge election integrity operation because let's be honest, half the country had a lot of questions, maybe more about 2020. Those questions were never answered. People are just supposed to forget about them and it's paramount 
that in the United States of America, we trust our electoral process. This is integral to who we are as a country. And so we are trying to reestablish that trust every day. We are doing everything we possibly can, making sure that people are confident that no matter if you're voting for a Republican, a Democrat, or a third party candidate, in this country, your vote matters and your vote counts. And unfortunately, we've gotten a lot of pushback from uh, Democrat run states. And it's been very challenging to get transparency in an issue where we really need transparency. But I believe that what we are doing right now at the RNC is going to further the notion that we do indeed have free, mm -hmm. fair and transparent elections. And so uh, I think Donald Trump saying if this is a free election and a fair election and there's no funny business here is a perfectly legitimate thing to say, because, again, you go ask half the country, okay. they don't feel like everything was completely fair in 2020. All right, Lara Trump, appreciate you joining us here on Bloomberg TV and Radio, the co-chair of the RNC. Thank you so much. And of course, for those that do still have questions about the results of 2020, Joe Biden did win the election and no court found uh, that there was anything actually wrong with the democratic process in the last election cycle. For a quick reaction now to our conversation with Lara, I turn back to Bloomberg Politics contributor Jeannie Shanzano, uh, of course, also of Iona University. Jeannie, just in our final moments, I would love your reaction to what we just heard uh, from co-chair Trump there, especially this notion that they're working toward free and fair elections. We have no indication at this point, correct, that they won't be free and fair? Uh, we don't. And, and of course, you know, just a few hours ago on Dr. Phil, Donald Trump said, quote, I won the election against Biden. And the reality is he lost by over seven million votes. That has been well established. There has been no evidence found in a number of court cases that there was any stolen votes in that election. So, you know, it is this kind of thing. Yes, we do need a free and fair election. We had one in 2020 and he lost. So it's that kind of thing that we have to, you know, just consider. And I would also say very, very interesting to hear her talking about the small dollar donors. As you look at percentage of what they have fundraised, Donald Trump is around 31 percent and uh, Harris is around 41 percent. So there is a gap there. But I agree with her. That is a critical number to be watching are those small dollar donors that they are taking in. Well, and the other thing to consider here is not just whether or not the Trump and the RNC have the ability to keep tapping that base, but whether Kamala Harris still can. We have a minute left, Jeannie. She obviously has seen a frenetic pace of, of fundraising, and she's enjoyed that since launching her candidacy. But is that really sustainable? Are these people who are likely to give to her more than once? Um, yeah, you know, she has done very well. The wind has been at her back, certainly. Um, they are going to try as hard as they can to keep it up. And I think it's noteworthy that Laura Trump was talking about Silicon Valley. They have been supportive of Trump, but unlike with Biden, they have also been supportive of Kamala Harris, of course, herself from California. So that is also an area to be watching. How much is the split in, from Silicon Valley between a Trump and a Harris? But she's going to try to keep up this pace. But it has been a stunning pace at over half of, at over five hundred million dollars at this point. Yeah, incredible to see how quickly the money race and the race overall has changed, as we just heard from the RNC co-chair herself, Laura Trump, talking about tightening margins in Pennsylvania, having to invest more in her home state of North Carolina as well. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Thank you so much. I'm Kaylee Lines with a look at the campaign trail. As, as we've told you, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls begin today a two-day bus tour of Georgia, targeting specifically rural areas of the states. The strategy here, or this state in particular, the strategy may be trying to drive out voters in these areas that they don't necessarily think they could win, but in where they could potentially reduce the margins, take their total vote count statewide a bit higher, and potentially get the 16 electoral college votes that come with it. So for more on this strategy, our political panel is with me, Jeannie Shanzano, Senior Democracy Fellow at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, and Maura Gillespie, Founder and Principal at Blue Jack Strategies, our Republican and Democratic uh, panelists today, respectively. 
Jeannie, first to you, just on this notion that they aren't going, although they will be in Savannah for a rally tomorrow to wrap this thing up. They're not necessarily targeting the cities, the urban areas in which the highest concentration usually of Democratic voters is on this tour. They're going instead to areas that you wouldn't necessarily think they stand a chance of winning. Is this a winning strategy, though, try to get the vote count at least higher in some of these other parts of the state? It is. And, and, you know, I think it's a strategy um, that Democrats have finally learned. Um, Joe Biden was the first Democrat to win Georgia in 28 years. And Raphael Warnock, John Ossoff, when they won the state as Democrats, they showed how to do it, which was not act as if Atlanta is Georgia. There are Democrats in those rural areas. And to your point, while they may not win them, they win the, the, the entire county, they can cut down on the Republicans' lead in those areas and make up for votes um, in other parts of the state. So that's what they're hoping to do. It's the same thing they're trying to do in Pennsylvania as well. Philadelphia is not Pennsylvania. We've got to hit those rural areas. So it's a very, very smart strategy. They're also going to force uh, Donald Trump to keep going back there because Georgia is something of a must win for Republicans to reach 270. Well, so Maura, that's the other side of this coin, right? The more places where Harrison Walls try to compete, the more places they force Trump and Vance to do the same, right? Absolutely. And to that point, you know, Georgia being so important for Republicans, it's also worth noting that the you know kind of beef that's been happening largely because of Donald Trump lashing out against Governor Brian Kemp, who is pretty popular, um, that doesn't bode well for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. But I think that the relationship that down ballot Republicans have with Governor Brian Kemp and their favorable you know respect for him, that they need to focus on that. Uh, you know, Trump should be really trying to repair that relationship because he needs Bre Governor Kemp uh, to to do well in Georgia. But I think what we are seeing with Harris and Walls and this tactic that Jeannie you know, referred to, it's meeting the voters where they are, understanding the long game, the big picture, and trying to meet them where they are and not necessarily just focusing on the cities. That's an important strategy um, and one that Republicans, you know, shouldn't take for granted a state like Georgia uh, that it needs to be sought after. Well, so should Republicans also then be spending time in cities they don't necessarily think they can win? outright more does this not go both ways absolutely and you saw that already this year you know you saw donald trump campaigning places where especially like in new york and places out in california and places where you know you wouldn't necessarily think that republicans even stood a chance but he did a similar tactic where he was meeting the voters where they were and seeing you know if there was a a group of voters to talk to that were receptive to his message or receptive to uh you know, in the case of Trump, we're subject to, uh, you know, kind of the fear that he is reminding them that, that stands to to be real if, if a at the time Biden Harris administration were to win again. But now with Harris at the top of the ticket, he's going to continue that messaging uh, and reminding folks who maybe aren't doing so well in this current economy and are worried about their safety and security. Uh, he can reach voters in urban areas and talk about safety and security. Uh, you know, I think that's a message that Republicans, again, as a as a party uh, will continue to echo. Well, and I want to focus more on the state of Georgia specifically for a moment longer, Jeannie, specifically the election rules that will govern Georgia come November when the votes are actually being counted. Earlier this month, the Georgia State Election Board voted to make it easier for county officials to delay or refuse the certification of election results. This is, of course, four years after 2020, in which the 12,000 vote margin was something of an issue for Donald Trump. It raised the, of course, infamous phone call. That's where the beef with uh, Georgia Republican leadership, including Brian Kemp, that Maura was referencing, did come from. How concerned should we be about these new rules in Georgia and what they could mean ultimately for us understanding who actually factually won the state in November? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you raised this because I think for as much as we talk about what Harris and Trump and Vance and, and Waltz are doing out on the campaign trail, the real action is going on at the state and local level in these boards, you know, with these election administrators. And we've already heard Donald Trump repeatedly laying the groundwork that if he doesn't win this election outright, something was amiss. And you see Democrats now 
taking this change that you mentioned with this board in Georgia to court to try to stop this change in the way that these votes are certified. Um, this is very important and we're seeing it in all of these swing states or many of them where these fights are ongoing. And of course, we also know that we're gonna have a lot of election observers on the ground and election day. And all of this could mean that come election day and election night, when we wake up the next morning or maybe don't go to sleep at all, we may not know who won because so much of this may be fought out in a county and state by state basis where these elections are obviously close and where we have rules changing unclear. And really you have a lot of power given to local election administrators in this case in Georgia. Maura, does this risk being a strategy that backfires for uh, Republicans for Donald Trump, who already is questioning whether he'll accept the election of results if he doesn't think it's fair? Is that something that could act as a deterrent for his supporters to go out and actually vote if they aren't necessarily sure that they can count on the results? I mean, if you're you know a kid and you're playing a game with if I like you know playing a game with your friend and they're constantly saying you're cheating, you're cheating. I really won. I really won. That gets old after a while. And honestly, it's just, it's annoying. And I think at some point, voters are just going to be very turned off by the fact that he's constantly, before the election has even happened, he's already, as Jenny pointed out, he's already saying that unless I win, if, or if I don't win, something, somebody cheated. So what does that mean that like, it's only if he wins that things are great and our system is perfect? That doesn't, I mean, if you're really thinking about this rationally, that's a terrible message to send out to the voters that their vote doesn't matter unless he wins. That's ridiculous. Um, and that's not how our system should ever work. I do agree that I think that this race is going to be very, very close, especially in neighboring states like North Carolina. It's going to be very, very close. Mm -hmm. The margin is very small there, and it has been for a number of years for the presidential. Uh, and so this is going to be one of those times where we have to rise above the fray of what Donald Trump is doing um, and really hope that we are, you know, a nation that can rise above juvenile, uh, you know, remarks as his. It, it, it's concerning to me that it'll backfire on down ballot races because people will be so disenfranchised to even engage that they won't remember that the down ballot impact is really important to vote for your representatives and your senators and your local school boards. That's really important. Well, Maura, I'm glad you brought up North Carolina because, Jeannie, after last week while we were in Chicago, we saw the uh, crystal ball, Sabato's crystal ball, move North Carolina into the toss-up column we now have just seen Cook's Cook political report do the same, North Carolina, to toss up. What does that mean for how both campaigns need to consider that state in particular, knowing that the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, a Democrat, was once on uh, Harris's shortlist. He could potentially be mobilized in this state. What, do, what does Harris need to do, and how do you expect Trump to try to counter her? Yeah, and at the DNC, we saw the final speaker before uh, Kamala Harris came out was none other than Roy Cooper, and that was not by mm -hmm. accident. He ended his speech by a shout out to the seven swing states. Um, so Democrats know, um, you mentioned that this had moved over in another forecasting model, and now it has moved over in Cook. And it means that Democrats have a chance there that they may not have had a month ago. And that means that once again, this is going to come down to money and time and organization. And Democrats have the benefit of having a very popular governor, Roy Cooper, at the top of that state. And of course, a rather controversial and unpopular Republican vying to be governor. Um, so that may dampen turnout amongst Republicans or get more Democrats out. So, you know, this was a very fascinating turn of events because there was a time not that long ago, like Republicans thought they had North Carolina in the bag, so to speak, not so much anymore, which means more money and more time for Republicans in a state they would like to have tied up and moved on to other more uh, important states. Well, it, it raises the question of whether Republicans, Donald Trump specifically, is going to have the kind of time and resources to dedicate to each one of these states, Mora, He is losing the fundraising game to Kamala Harris, at least at this point. It's Harris that has the cash advantage. How does that need to change how his uh, campaign thinks about targeting these states if they aren't necessarily going to have the same kind of dollars to spend that the opponent will? 
Right. And you mentioned earlier that Donald Trump is out there on the campaign trail, that he has moved, you know, he's he's doing these rallies. But the problem is that during these rallies, he espouses the things about election and the big lie and things of that nature um, and spewing off things that, you know, it would take forever just to fact check everything he says. And that we have seen in North Carolina when the alt-right policies come through is when Democrats actually end up doing better. So you have this candidate, Robinson, who has said, you know, basically anyone who advocated for birth control was a witch. You know, he says outlandish things. But we saw Roy Cooper was elected because largely of a alt-right bill that got put in place before his election. So, uh, you know, it's it's. Yes, it's important that Trump is out there on the campaign trail, but it's not helpful to down ballot Republicans if he is espousing conspiracy theories and outlandish and, you know, again, derogatory things towards other people. It, it just isn't helpful to their messaging on the economy and safety and security because he can't stay on message. So, uh, you know, North Carolina being a flip uh, toss up state makes sense, complete sense to me, given what they have and Robinson, but also the super school superintendent, state superintendent um, Morrison. So it's just that's a problem as well. Or Moro, I think her name is. Yeah. So. All right. Maura Gillespie of Blue Stack Strategies and Bloomberg Politics contributor Jeannie Shanzano, our political panel today. Thank you so much. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome back. I am Kaylee Lines here on Bloomberg TV and radio as we cover the beginning of the bus tour of Georgia for the Democratic ticket. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz targeting specifically southern rural areas of this critical swing state. It's ahead of a rally they will hold in Savannah tomorrow. And of course, it coincides with recent polls that show Harris is doing better than Joe Biden was in Georgia before he left the race in July. The latest New York Times Siena poll finding Trump up by four points, but that is within the margin of error. They're trying to make a difference in the Sun Belt, it seems. So for more, let's turn to someone who has been spending a lot of time on the campaign trail lately. Bloomberg's Riley Griffin is here with me in studio. So Riley, I know you've been with Donald Trump this week. I do want to just begin, though, with what the Democratic ticket is doing. The idea that they're devoting two full days and resources to Georgia, a state that seems like it was Donald Trump's to lose just five weeks ago. What does that signal about the odds they think they have down south? They certainly think Georgia is at play. This two-day bus tour, which will weave through rural communities and land in Savannah, as you mentioned, is a sign that this is a state they think they have the potential to win. And ironically, you know, Kamala Harris is campaigning there this week. As you mentioned, Trump is currently up in the polls in Georgia. Trump is in Michigan, Mm -hmm. where Kamala is perceived to have an edge. So they are flip-flopping. They're in each other's uh, (laughs) potential battleground state. Well, and I I know you were with Trump in Michigan earlier this week, where he was focusing specifically on foreign policy, the Afghanistan withdrawal, which, of course, we're marking three years uh, since this week, blaming Harris effectively for how how that went. Interesting to take a foreign policy message to Michigan. Yeah, well, notably, he was speaking before a crowd of National Guard members. Mm -hmm. Um, It was the National Guard Association's annual meeting. So he had a a crowd of troops. um, And this speech resonated with them. We saw a lot of people in the crowd cheering, standing, laughing. Um, And that message about Afghanistan that he projected onto Harris extended to other foreign policy matters. He talked about a perceived U.S. weakness in the rest of the world. He talked about foreign policy with China. He he went so far as to associate the withdrawal um, from Afghanistan with October 7th in Israel, Mm -hmm. which is a, a, a big leap, but one that resonated with the crowd. Yeah, it's something I've been asking a lot of Middle East es- experts about this this week, whether there is some blame that should be cast on that withdrawal. It seems uh, to get mixed reviews. A lot of uh, people have indicated that these things are very separate, but it's still a good point. And of course, J.D. Vance himself is going to be in a number of other swing states today. The other parts of the blue wall, Pennsylvania, and then later on, Wisconsin. This is a pretty frenetic pace of campaigning we're starting to see from the Republican ticket after they were... Well, of course, Vance hasn't always been on it, but Donald Trump himself wasn't out and about on this many weekdays. 
during the campaign just a month ago. You can see that they are responding to the momentum of the Harris Walls campaign in the wake of the DNC, and certainly in anticipation of the closely watched debate that is forthcoming mm -hmm. on September 10th. So a lot of momentum to build. There's a really short runway to Election Day, but not just Election Day. Early ballots will start to be cast in coming weeks. So the the, the game has started today, and, and they are moving. You mentioned that Trump is um, in Michigan. He will also have a event in Potterville, Michigan, a very small town of 3,000 people mm -hmm. this coming um, Thursday. And so the rural vote is at play, the suburban vote is at play, the youth vote is at play, and specifically in these seven swing states, they are making their mark. Well, just because you brought up the youth vote, and I might consider myself a youth in this area, though I think <laughs> Taylor Swift probably transcends generations, Swifties for Kamala has begun. Without Taylor Swift, though, this isn't Taylor leading the charge, but Swifties are, are back in Harris up. Yes, last night we saw the first ever event for Swifties for Kamala. Um, the campaign manager is actually someone who formerly ran John Fetterman's campaign in Pennsylvania. So these young digital strategists are seizing the Swift momentum, despite the <laughs> fact that she didn't come out at the DNC like many of us hoped. Um, and Trump himself is doing that, too. He posted a user-generated, excuse me, AI-generated mm -hmm. picture of Taylor Swift backing him. So both parties would no doubt love that support uh, were she one day to formally make a commitment to one or the other. But Swifties right now are coming out on their own, and um, Elizabeth Warren was on that call. So you're seeing <laughs> Democrats join in. Is Elizabeth Warren a Swiftie? She identified as a Swifty. Everybody on the call had to name their favorite song. Um, wow. Ed Markey was on the call. So you saw a lot of Dems uh, coming and letting the people know which Swift song was theirs. <laughs> which one was Elizabeth Warren's? Oh, I can't remember. You're testing me which one is yours. All too well. Ten-minute version, obviously. <laughs> that is the only right answer for anyone uh, considering. But it does speak to this point that she has been able to do something with social media with her campaign that we weren't necessarily seeing with Joe Biden. And he raised the debate that's going to happen in a couple weeks. It's on September 10th. It, it does raise the question of how much of that is going to be the, the people who will watch it live versus the moments that could go viral, that will be recirculated on TikTok or wherever uh, social platform people find themselves in the aftermath. Ideally... Either candidate wants to, to reach both, the audience that is tuning into cable news and, and the audience that is finding these clippable moments on TikTok. And we saw at the DNC 200 influencers mm -hmm. get credentials to come and snap those little moments. It's, in fact, something that the Harris Walls campaign has come under a little bit of criticism from because they haven't done big scale press interviews. But we actually get one of those this Thursday on yep. CNN with Dana Bash. Both uh, Vice President Harris and, and Governor Tim Walls will be joining um, CNN for that first kind of reveal. So another highly watched moment before the debate. And of course, that interview being taped in Georgia, where the ticket is today. Bloomberg's Riley Griffin, thank you so much covering the campaign trail for us as we get closer and closer to that vote in November. Appreciate it. And of course, as we get closer to that vote and talk more about these candidates, is this worth pointing out that one of the candidates is still facing some legal difficulty, and there was a development in that regard for Donald Trump yesterday. He was hit with a new superseding indictment from Special Counsel Jack Smith in the 2020 election interference case here in Washington. It still charges him with the same four crimes. He still is the sole defendant, and yet it removes some things that could have been classified as official acts in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision in July that found Donald Trump is at least partially immune from official acts taken as president. I spoke more about this new indictment last night with Nick Ackerman, former Watergate prosecutor, and this is how he explained what's really different here. What the government has done here is rather than take the initial indictment and mark it up before the judge, because Judge Chutkin has to decide which acts that are charged in here were official acts or which were unofficial acts, official acts would presumably be uh, immune. Uh, so what the government has done is they've basically redone the indictment, taken out uh, that entire section on the Department of Justice and that Jeffrey Clark would be made the attorney general because he was going to send a phony letter to the various state legislatures saying that there was fraud in the election when there was no such fraud. Uh, but what they've done is they've re alleged everything else in terms of acts that were not official. That was Nick Ackerman last night. We turn now to another legal expert, Dave 
Aaron Berg is with me. He is the state attorney in Palm Beach County. Welcome back to Bloomberg TV and radio, Dave. It's been a while. We weren't necessarily thinking that there would be something new in Trump legal world necessarily yesterday, but this did drop in our laps. And I think the question all of us had immediately is what really does this change about the likelihood that Donald Trump could actually be found guilty or innocent of these crimes, whether or not it goes to trial before the election. Does that all remain the same, even if it it does try to bring this prosecution forward and someday does it not necessarily accelerate the way in which it does? Bailey, good to be back with you. This means that the cases are going forward, but they're not going to happen before the election. There will be no trial of Donald Trump before the election, except there could be a mini trial in Washington, D.C. in the election interference case. It is possible that Jack Smith pushes for this open this hearing where Mike Pence testifies and you find out more details about Trump's involvement before and after January 6th, whether they were official acts or unofficial acts. It would be up to Judge Chutkin. There have been reports mm-hmm. recently that Jack Smith and the Department of Justice did not want to go forward with the mini trial, but we haven't heard anything from Jack Smith yet that's still a possibility. But even though these filings uh, took place, they do not mean that these cases are going to be heard before the election. They will be happening after the election. It just means that if Trump loses the election, it will be game on for him in court. Hmm. Well, just because you raised the former vice president, Mike Pence, Dave, I do wonder what you think about the fact that he is still included in this indictment for being vice president, communications that the president was having with his vice president at the time. The vice president, of course, having that ceremonial role in the certification of the election. Is that actually something that could be damaging to Jack Smith's case, the fact that that was not removed from this new superseding indictment? Well, Jack Smith decided to go right up to the line because that was a gray area. The Supreme Court said, yeah, we're going to give it a presumption of immunity because talking to your vice president is an official act. On the other hand, If Mike Pence is acting as the president of the Senate, then it doesn't mean that's an official act. It may not be an official act. Plus, Trump allegedly was acting as an office seeker, not an office holder, someone who was trying to overturn the election and trying to convince Mike Pence as the president of the Senate, not as the vice president, to throw out the ballot. So I see why Jack Smith did what he did. I think he's right to do it. But it shows you that Jack Smith decided to err on the side of moving forward with the prosecution, of prosecuting Trump, rather than deferring to the Supreme Court's broad immunity decision and saying, we're going to take steps back. No, he's going right up to that line. I think it's a good move. Well, on the subject of the Supreme Court's immunity decision, we got a a bit more on that from one of the justices who, of course, dissented, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, sat for an interview on CBS and was talking about this case. And, and, she basically just kind of talked about her concerns regarding immunity. Take a listen to what she said, Dave, and I'll have more for you. I was concerned about uh, a system that appeared to provide immunity for one individual under one set of circumstances. When we have a criminal justice system that had ordinarily treated everyone the same. I think there are legal issues that arise out of the political process. And so the Supreme Court has to be prepared to respond uh, if, if that should be necessary. And I wonder, Dave, if you ultimately think this question is coming back to Justice uh, Ketanji Brown-Jackson and her other colleagues on the court. Is that ultimately where this goes? Could we see, once again, Trump appealing uh, this new indictment and the court being put back in the position where it has to delineate what is an official and unofficial action in a way that it did not in its initial ruling in July. This is definitely heading back to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court's decision was broad, but it was also vague. It was confusing. And you have these standards that need to be fleshed out. So what's going to happen is that Jack Smith refiled the indictment. He trimmed off the fat. You know, they're not going to go after the communications with the Department of Justice and Jeff Clark and the attempts to remove the acting attorney general, but everything else is a go. And then Trump is going to say, no, it should not uh, be a go. You shouldn't be able to prosecute me for talking to Mike Pence, for example. It'll get appealed. It'll go all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they're going to have to give more meat on the bones of their decision. I thought the decision that Justice Roberts put out 
was way beyond the pale. So it was being confusing. It was unprecedented. It gave the executive branch way more power than ever before in our country's history. So anything that provides a little more detail, a little more guidance is a good thing. And yes, it is headed back up to the Supreme Court at some point, which means more delays in this case. Well, on the subject of delays in the cases relating to former President Donald Trump, we, of course, saw the case that's in your neck of the woods, Dave, the documents case in Florida, delayed, 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 until ultimately it was outright dismissed earlier this summer by Judge Eileen Cannon, who, of course, was a Trump appointee. We did hear from Jack Smith also this week in essentially trying to get that case to be revived and to move forward, filing essentially an appeal that says, hey, I was constitutionally appointed. That's obviously not what Judge Cannon uh, found in this case. Do you expect he will be successful? Will this be a case that is able to move forward? Yes. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeal, a conservative circuit, will overturn Judge Cannon. I feel very confident in that because Judge Cannon's ruling lies in the face of all legal precedent. There have been other courts repeatedly that have allowed the special counsel to continue that Now, this is the first time a judge has ever said that the special counsel was unconstitutional because he has too much independence, which ironically is the opposite of what Donald Trump has been saying on the campaign trail, saying Jack Smith is just a tool for Merrick Garland and Joe Biden and the politicization of the DOJ. Uh, It's the opposite argument that his lawyers made in court. And in the end, Judge Cannon went along in a decision that I think certainly will be reversed by the 11th Circuit. I then think the Supreme Court may weigh in. Now, I can't say what the Supreme Court's going to do because... They seem to uh, find new ways to bring out extremist opinions. And so we'll see if they then create new rules. But I think for sure she will be overturned by the 11th Circuit. Then the question is, will she be removed from the case? Jack Smith did not ask for her to be removed from the case. I think it's unlikely, but the 11th Circuit could on its own say enough. You have been reversed on the special master in this case uh, twice, and now you're reversed here Let's find a new judge. It's possible, but probably unlikely. And what's the timeline for all of this to play out? Dave, I'm guessing this also not likely to be something resolved prior to November. Yeah, Jack Smith seems to have taken his foot off the gas, knowing that this is never going to be tried before the election. And I think the 11th Circuit also realizes that there's no urgency in having to do this. So this will be months, uh, and then they'll come out with a ruling, and then it will be appealed to the Supreme Court. So The one thing that Trump is successful at is delay. Win or lose, the delays are going to happen. And if he is elected president again, then it will pay off for him because his new attorney general will certainly drop every federal case against him. He'll be left with the New York and the Georgia cases, but then it'll be a constitutional crisis as to what happens when you have a president facing a criminal trial in Georgia in a state case while he's sitting in the White House. Uh, We've never been down this road before. Yeah, it's incredible to consider the possibility. Dave Ehrenberg, always great to have you here on Balance of Power. Appreciate your time. Dave Ehrenberg, of course, is Palm Beach County's state attorney. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We've also been watching geopolitics this week, too, including the visit to China by U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. He met today with officials, including the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, And we got a readout from the White House about that meeting. They say the two sides held, and this is a quote, candid, substantive, and constructive discussions, including Sullivan raising concerns about trade and unfair trade policies and the importance of peace in the Taiwan Strait. The statement also says that they discussed planning for a leader-level call in the coming weeks. So maybe we should be on watch for Joe Biden and Xi Jinping to have a conversation. We want to have more on this visit and what tangible outcomes really we can expect. Mary Lovely is joining me now. She is senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Welcome back to Bloomberg, Mary. Always great to have you. So we know that they discussed these things that they've been discussing for some time, but even the statement itself alludes to the notion that they just are prioritizing the dialogue happening and maintaining communication. Is that really all this visit is about? 
Well, you know, I think the dialogue is important. It has certainly changed. We've seen since the meeting in San Francisco last year between the two leaders, a real change in China's approach, for example, to American multinationals operating in the Chinese market. So it has produced some uh, tangible changes. And of course, it's always good when the temperature is a bit reduced and when we think that the leaders are trying to solve problems. So I would say, yes, this is important. We're seeing some movement. We've had um, important dialogues uh, between key U.S. Uh, agencies and their counterparts in China. We're seeing perhaps some movement on the fentanyl problem um, and a lot of high level discussions around Taiwan where uh, I think everybody yeah. wants to avoid an unintended, uh, you know, conflict. So I think this is good news. And it's good news also that they're talking about perhaps a leadership call uh, before the election. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the leaders that will be speaking, it will include one leader who has made himself effectively a lame duck. Joe Biden will no longer be president of the United States come January. Mary, how does that change the nature of of these discussions, is China going to be making any commitments to an outgoing president? No, I don't think China's going to be making any commitments, but um, it's important because a lot of the work is done under the presidential level. So it's done at the agencies. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is important to continue those dialogues and also to, to clarify issues. Now, obviously, we have two candidates for president who hold very different views on China, are likely to pursue very different policies. So the election is going to have a big impact on U.S.-China relations. And you're right, Kaylee, that uh, President Xi Jinping knows that and will not make commitments. But it's still an important meeting, I think. Yeah. Mary, do you think Xi Jinping has a preference in terms of the outcome of the U.S. election, knowing what Donald Trump is saying he'll do in regard to tariffs on Chinese goods specifically, though it is kind of a bipartisan thing these days to be hawkish on China? Do you think China thinks there is a real difference here? Well, I always say the last thing anybody wants to do is to, is to predict what's in Xi Jinping's mind. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. So I, I won't say, but I will say that they do understand that there is a difference. And um, President Trump sometimes is viewed as someone that China might prefer because, you know, they 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 cut a deal with him on the phase one deal. And, and in some sense, mm -hmm. that is viewed as something they can work with. Um, I would say that President Biden has been more effective in terms of re restricting the flow of technology to China yeah. um, and again, engage, engaging our allies in terms of joining those sanctions. So uh, there is some possibility that that they would prefer a Trump administration. On the other hand, the Trump policies, at least from an economics perspective, are widely viewed as deeply destabilizing. And the last thing China needs, uh, which as widely reported with a soft economy right now, is more global instability. So I think mm -hmm. they would look at a continuation of the Biden uh, policies in some sense through a Harris administration as welcome as well. Well, I'm glad you raised uh, the technology uh, export constraints that the Biden administration has put in place, because of course, we're all awaiting for after the bell today, results from NVIDIA. This is a company that has been affected by the export controls. There are restraints around the kind of chips, the caliber of chips that they can sell in China. How much tighter do you expect those constraints on, on critical technology like semiconductors will get regardless of who uh, the next administration is. Is this an area in which especially the companies who are making these things are going to have to expect at some point they can't sell to China at all? I think that is correct. I think every tech executive knows that this is a this is probably going to be a no-go area. Interestingly, we've been doing new research and, you know, the Trump administration, the Biden administration imposed um, export controls on and through the entity list, which restricts the types of things that you can sell to Chinese firms, um, they 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 used it about you know as equally as often. About about uh, four hundred firms were listed by each. Um, so you know this is not something new. I think it's something that firms are going to have to have to deal with. But I think it's also something that we as Amer you know Americans more generally have to deal with because. It has side effects. It looks like it's a cheap way to 
prevent techno technology flowing out or unwanted technolo technology transfer to China. It's not on the budget, but it obviously has costs for these firms. As you noted, it, it, it affects their revenue and their stock price. And these are firms that rely on that revenue to do the R&D that keeps the United States at the forefront. So restricting their revenue in this way is a very, a very potentially dangerous aspect to this whole policy. Obviously, there's a lot of good reasons why we want to restrict technology, but it's, it's not the type of tool that can be used without careful consideration of side effects. Other side effects, of course, are that these companies in China will just go to competitor firms. And the mm -hmm. more we use them, the less our allies are willing to go along with us. And so those sales will just move from American firms to foreign firms. And lastly, of course, we have greatly incentivized Xi Jinping's uh, desire and the flow of funds to technology firms inside China for indigenous innovation. And as we've always known with dual use technology, there will be a catch up. Uh, the U.S. is trying to stay way more than one generation ahead, but we are really fueling their catch up process. So it's an important tool addressing important and imperative concerns for the United States, but it's something that has to be used very carefully. All right, Mary Lovely, it's always great to have you here on Balance Thank of Power. You. Thank you so much for joining us, of course, coming to us from the Peterson Institute. It'll be interesting to see what kind of commentary around China we do get from NVIDIA when it reports after the bell. I would point out that this stock, which of course represents 7% of the S&P 500, right now is down about 2.6% on the day. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.